Welcome to the Rejected Religion Podcast. I'm Stephanie Shea. This month's guest is Dr. Luke Walker. Luke has published widely on the intersections between British Romantic poetry, American counterculture, and esotericism. Many of these can be found on his academia.edu page. He is now writing a book entitled William Blake and Allen Ginsberg, Romanticism, Counterculture, and Radical Reception. Luke gained his PhD from the University of Sussex in 2015 and subsequently taught there and at other British universities. He is currently employed outside academia as a political campaigns coordinator. In part one, Luke discusses the great influence of the poet and artist William Blake on Allen Ginsberg, one of the most influential people from the Beat Generation and the quote-unquote counterculture movement of 1960s United States. He also talks in detail about Ginsberg's Blake vision, the name Ginsberg gave to a series of extraordinary events in his life in 1948. We then discuss Luke's article called Tangled Up in Blake that focuses on Ginsberg's views about Bob Dylan and their complex relationship. Lastly, we talk about the influence of Buddhism on Ginsberg and how this affected his views about Blake and his worldview in general. I hope you enjoy part one. Welcome to the podcast, Luke. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm very excited to be able to talk to you today, focusing uh, again on esotericism and art, and this time in particular on poetry and music. Uh, in preparation for this interview, I've read quite a bit of your work that centers around William Blake and Allen Ginsberg, uh, which I enjoyed learning more about. This was, you know, outside of my area, so I really, uh, really enjoyed, uh, yeah, de- delving into all of that. Uh, so let's just jump right in. Uh, while many people have likely heard of William Blake and know that he was a poet and artist, as well as an important figure of the Romantic age. There are probably those who are not aware of Blake's own accounts of visions and prophecies, uh, his conversations with angels, his radical politics, his ideas about racial and sexual equality, and his enormous influence on the beat poets of the 1950s and the quote-unquote counterculture of the 1960s. So could I start our discussion by asking a two-part question? Uh, the first part, what was it about Blake's works and ideas, in your opinion, that garnered such a popular posthumous reception? And the second part, why were so many artists fascinated or influenced by Blake, not only in the Romantic Age, but also in the more contemporary uh, counterculture of the United States? Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and yes, thanks for taking the time to to read through through my various uh, articles and chapters and uh, and to um to prepare um so yeah i mean i i suppose partly i want to say that uh i do feel that alan ginsburg himself and we'll come on in a minute i'm sure to a little bit more about his his background but that that ginsburg himself was very much at the center of a kind of Blakean revival in the 1960s. And he had himself previously worked in advertising before he sort of became this, uh, this beat poet and countercultural figure. So he was very clued up on, on kind of how to, to spread the word about uh, things that, you know, people and things that he was interested in. So on the one hand, I do feel that Ginsburg yeah, it was really at, at the core of a, of a kind of 60s countercultural revi- revival in Blake. But on the other hand, we can really see how ever since Blake's own time, so Blake was born in 1757, died in 1827, um, ever since his time and, and shortly afterwards through the 19th century, different countercultures, if I think we, we can use that word, even pre-1960s, so different earlier countercultures had their own kind of encounters with Blake. And, and there's a, almost a sort of countercultural history um, and a countercultural Blakeian history that kind of 
comes through the, the 19th century and, and then through the early 20th century, mid 20th century as well, and then kind of feeds into this 60s interest in Blake. So in a way, I'm kind of, I suppose, saying almost two slightly contradictory things. On the one hand, Ginsburg was really responsible for, you know, making Blake big in the 60s. On the other hand, he was part of a, both a kind of pre-existing countercultural tradition and he was part of a kind of pre-existing series of countercultural interests in in Blake in in different periods. So Blake in his own time was kind of famously or 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 infamously unknown as a poet. So uh, and 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 as an artist. Um and he he lived much of his life in well uh, parts of his life in in quite extreme poverty and other parts of his life in slightly more comfortable uh, kind of um material situation but still without a great deal of of, of comfort or, or acknowledgement of, of his work. Um, although that, you know, that, that picture of Blake has also been challenged at different points by different scholars o- over the years and sort of pointing out the, the connections that he did have in his own time. So he, uh, in, within Blake's own, own period, uh, the Romantic period, uh, he was actually connected to different radical cultures in that period and to different radical figures in his own time who were well known in their own time as well so he had he had famous friends as it, as it were even if he himself still kind of remained within you know a significant amount of obscurity so he was friends with tom paine for example um you know who who became a um you know a major political figure in the in the french revolution and the american revolution mm-hmm. Um, he was friends with Mary Wollstonecraft, or he knew Mary Wollstonecraft anyway. He may not have been some sort of close friends of her, but he, he was part of the circle around Mary Wollstonecraft, who was, you know, of course, a you know early feminist uh, figure and um, important in her sort of radical sexual politics. And these were both figures who who were very much well known in in their own time. Um, so Blake was part of a kind of radical scene, I suppose you could say, uh, even though not very many people <laughs> outside of this this kind of tight circle knew him in his own time. Um, and then, by sort of, not not so long after his death in uh, eighteen twenty seven, um, different figures started to kind of rediscover Blake's work. Um, including in America, and actually some of there's been some very interesting recent research on um, the degree in which in the sort of early to mid-19th century, it was in America as much as it was in the UK that Blake was being rediscovered. So figures uh, from the, you know, uh, amongst the American transcendentalists, for example, like uh, mm-hmm. like Thoreau and Emerson, mm-hmm. um were were interested in in Blake uh, in in that kind of early to mid nineteenth uh, century period, um, and um, there was even an interest in Blake within the early um, abolitionist movement as well. So different kind of figures who 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 rediscover Blake, um, and then as as we go through further into the sort of mid to late 19th century then the the big kind of blake revival the first big blake revival before the kind of popular blake revival of the 1960s was actually in the 1860s when um the pre-raphaelite poets and artists um uh, the rossetti brothers and the rossetti siblings christina rossetti as well um all became very interested in blake and were able to sort of promote blake in that period um and then, you know, get through into the sort of late 19th century and early 20th century, we had, you know, he, Blake, an in, a strong interest in Blake emerged within um, figures like William, but- William but- Butler Yeats, um, who, who was a sort of early scholar of Blake as well, actually, as, as the Rossetti siblings also were, to some extent, sort of early scholars of Blake as well. Um, so these were all figures who are, within their own times we could see as countercultural. I mean we could see the transcendentalists in America as as part of a kind of counterculture. Uh we can see the um the pre Raphaelites uh in the kind of mid to late nineteenth century again as a as a as a sort of counterculture. And then uh, Blake uh, sorry, Yates uh, with his interest in all sorts of esoteric topics. 
um, and, and involvement in different kind of esoteric movements like mm -hmm. the Golden Dawn, uh, you know, also very much part of a, you know, a sort of a counterculture. Um, so one of the things that later on when Ginsburg got into Blake in the, the 1950s and, and onwards, uh, one of the things that he was interested in, in thinking about was the way in which the Romantic period itself within thinking, you know, thinking particularly with, um, about the British Romantics of the sort of 18, uh, sorry, 1790s uh, and onwards, um, that they themselves could also be seen as a kind of a counterculture. And that even though Blake himself, there's no evidence really that Blake himself took drugs or took, you know, deliberately mm -hmm. took psychoactive substances with the, you know, with this sort of um, uh, intention of altering his consciousness, because of course we all take <laughs> drugs in different ways all the time, you know, but... Um, yeah. Uh, and, and um, you know, opium in that period was, was also a, you know, commonly used medicine, painkiller, you know, that, that everyone was taking. Um, but there's no evidence that, that Blake kind of deliberately used drugs as a, as a form of mind expansion. But other figures within that period and within that circle very much did. And, and you know, in, a, in some ways, the, the British Romantic period and, and some of the key figures amongst the British Romantics, you know, this was a real kind of druggy scene. Um, and Ginsburg was fascinated by that and, you know, very much wanted to sort of um, highlight that. So, you know, you had De Quincey, of course, taking opium and writing Confessions of an Opium Addict. Um, Coleridge, again, became addicted to opium, but also wrote very much on and about that, you know, that. You had Humphrey Davy, who uh, discovered or invented uh, laughing gas, nitrous oxide in that period, and was also totally part of that kind of scene. Um, so I suppose what I want to say is there are all these different kind of countercultures, some of them interested in Blake later, or some of them like within Blake's own time that Blake in a way was a part of, even though he was sort of on the edge of it, um, which were pre-existing countercultures. And, and they sort of seem to keep returning and rediscovering uh, Blake uh, you know, through through time. Mm, right. It's very interesting about the mind-altering substances. A lot of people think that it maybe make the assumption that yeah, that was just the that was just the '60s things. That was that was the LSD thing. That was the you know what was the famous saying. Um, tune in and drop out or whatever, you know, that, that was just in that period of time. Tune, but, in, tune in, turn on and drop that's, out. That's yes, it. Totally Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, thinking that that was just more of a contemporary thing, but actually, yeah, now that you mention it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. That, that they were also experimenting with other mind altering substances uh, at other periods of time as well. That wasn't just uh, exclusive to, to our contemporary times. Mm. Um, We've already mentioned uh, Allen Ginsberg and how uh, you know important he is uh, in this uh, the 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 contemporary counterculture uh, movement and in the beat poets uh, generation as it, as it is known. Uh, and we know that Blake had this you know really extreme influence on him. Uh, and you write that the this influence was so much so that. In 1948, Ginsburg had a series of extraordinary experiences that he later named his quote, quote unquote, Blake vision. Could you talk more about this Blake vision and how this influenced Ginsburg and his subsequent activities in and around these two movements of the, the beats and the, and the counterculture? Absolutely. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. So, I mean, perhaps first I should just go back a little bit to, to explain, you know, to, to part of your previous question and just to just to explain a little bit more about Blake and, and his own visions as well. And then we can okay. see how Ginsburg's vision, you know, uh, several hundred years later, uh, sort of also linked back, you know, in a way Ginsburg was having visions of or involving a visionary figure. <laughs> you see what I mean? Right, so, so right. several layers of you know, layers of visionary experience yes. going on there. So so Blake had you know Blake had a very unusual childhood where he was largely home educated. He grew up absolutely steeped in religion and the Bible. 
um, but also uh, within a very much of a sort of alternative dissenting uh, tradition of Protestant Christianity, uh, where sort of outside of the established church. Um, and for a long time, it was actually not really known what particular religious traditions his parents had had belonged to or had been involved in, although it was very clear from Blake's work and from his, um, you know, the way in which he explores different uh, religious and visionary sort of themes within his within his work, um, that he clearly did belong to some, you know, sort of unusual strand of, of, um, of, of religion. And then quite recently, it's just it's just come out that Blake's mother had actually been a Moravian, um, the Moravians um, in that time, uh, I mean, the Moravian tradition still exists today, but at that time, in that sort of early period of the Moravian um, Christian tradition, this was actually a very radical um, dissenting um, and, yeah, quite uh, unusual tradition with some, with some very unusual ideas about, um, for example, uh, the... Um, you could say the gender and sort of sexuality of Christ um, and uh, some ideas about um, sort of seeing Christ as a mother figure as well as a, um, you know, as well as, you know, as, as well as the son or as well as associated with a sort of father God. Um, and um, yeah, some, some, some really, really kind of interesting uh, ideas there. So, Interesting that, that Blake, you know, we we do now know that Blake, although Blake wasn't brought up as a Moravian, but that his mother had previously been involved with the Moravians. Um, so we we know we're starting to kind of understand some of the different, you know, very in, intricate and, and interesting kind of religious spiritual elements that fed into Blake's own world. And and Blake grew up, as I said, out of school having visions, having visions of, of God, having visions of angels in trees as a child, um, having all sorts of... And, and and that seemed to have stayed with him through his whole life. He seemed to have, you know, retained some kind of non-ordinary consciousness or, or, you know, perspective on the world in which the imagination, which which was a word that he, that he used and which he saw as being a sort of... Um, very spiritual, uh, important part of part of life. So not fantasy, but you know, but a kind of yeah. truer um, imaginative perception of the world was with him, con- you know, constantly and consistently. Um, so a really, uh, you know, a highly unusual figure, um, Blake. And and of course, there's been you know over the years, different scholars have sort of wanted to think about you know, can we can we see different kind of mental health issues within Blake's, you know, perspective on the world? Can we see uh, neurodiversity, you know, within, within his, you know, his, his highly unusual life and and kind of unusual perspective and unusual way of seeing the world, you know, um, and, you know, or, or, or from a historical perspective, you know, how do we just associate Blake with all of these different religious uh, traditions mostly from Christianity, but he obviously also had interest in, in other non-Christian traditions as well. Um, you know, how can we historicize that, you know, that mm. really unusual kind of perspective on the world that Blake had? So Blake had, um, just just to move on to Ginsburg's Blake vision of 1948, um, Blake himself had had a kind of an experience when he'd been living uh, for a very brief period of his life around 1800, where Blake had moved out of London for the only time in his whole life when he left the boundaries of London. He, he was absolutely a sort of Londoner all his life. But for a couple of years, he moved down to the Sussex countryside, very close to where I live now, actually, in, in, in Sussex um, and in England. And he, um, he'd had a vision in that time where uh, the, the poet Milton, uh, who lived a couple of hundred years before Blake, um, had had kind of appeared to him and and had um had had a sort of you know Blake had had a kind of spiritual connection with with Milton through this experience which he then and then fed into Blake's work as well um and so Blake himself sort of almost saw himself as to some extent a not not a reincarnation but having you know having a sort of um element of Milton's spirit that had entered into him mm-hmm. um at, at that time 
And so when Ginsburg, you know, 150 or so years later, um, had his own unusual spiritual experience uh, where, where he felt that Blake spoke to him uh, in 1948, in a way, you know, this was kind of reproducing, an, you know, Blake's own experience that he'd had, that Blake had had with Milton. So, and, and Ginsburg was very aware of that. So just to, just to very briefly kind of um, explain what had happened to Ginsburg, Ginsburg was a uh, young um, American Jewish student uh, at university, at Columbia University. Uh, I think he was 22 at the time, uh, 1948. Uh, he was he was writing some some kind of bits of poetry, but he was not published yet at that time. He'd just recently met the other Beats, so he'd he'd met Kerouac and he'd met William Burroughs. Um, but he was he was a student, and to some extent he was a kind of struggling student as well. Though he'd um, Ginsburg himself came from a fairly middle class intellectual kind of uh, family. His father had been a poet as well, actually. Um, although a much more kind of conventional lyric poet. Um, and um, Ginsburg in 1948 uh, was, it was the, sort of the summer, it was the, you know, the university vacation period. He was on his own. Um, he was living in a flat uh, in Harlem, which he was subletting from a philosophy, uh, sorry, a, um, a theology student. Um, and he was kind of surrounded by all these theology books. Uh, in in the flat, uh, in the apartment, and he he was he was having you know was having a tough time. He'd recently broken up or been rejected by Neil Cassidy, another another beat figure, um, and uh, he was was living on his own, uh, reading all these books that were all around him, and the books can, you know included. Um, classic works of, of uh, philosophy, you know, Plato, Plotinus, um, things like that, uh, works by Christian mystics of the Middle Ages as well, um, and then Ginsberg had his own Blake books as well. He was already interested in, in Blake in that period, although, you know, not, not to the extent that he would later become. Um, and he was reading all of these books, and he was also reading William James, uh, the um, varieties of religious experience, um, and so of course several of these texts actually include, you know, especially William James, of course, but also um, you know Plato and Plotinus and, and the Christian mystics, you know, actually include, um, you know, that they're about um, visionary experience, I suppose you could say <laughs> to, yeah. to a large extent. And so in some ways, it's, it's almost hardly surprising that Ginsburg in this, you know, especially being in this sort of rather isolated, rather kind of unhappy um, period in, in his life, um, you know, surrounding himself with these books and living on his own, you know, should, should then have a, a kind of similar experience himself. But so he, he was, uh, according to the kind of the, according to the, the version of this experience that's most commonly referred to anyway because Ginsburg actually had some quite different explanations of this experience at different points in his life but according to the the kind of main version that's that's usually used uh, when talking about this um Ginsburg was reading different poems by Blake uh, and at at some point he felt that Blake's voice spoke started speaking to him and started reading the poems out loud to him um this kind of disembodied you know visionary voice uh, whatever 130 years or whatever after you know after Blake's death um and alongside that you know this wasn't just a kind of auditory hallucination uh but also very much a kind of psychedelic experience that that he had alongside that where he he felt like he he sort of entered into a deeper consciousness. Uh, he sort of saw a kind of truer version of reality around him. He looked out of the window and sort of saw the sky, and he saw the buildings around him, and they seemed to kind of be almost glowing with a, you know, with a with a, a kind of new light of consciousness almost. And um, and then over the next few days, he had several further kind of similar experiences, often again associated with reading. Blake's poems and then afterwards kind of or during the reading of the poems kind of having these experiences not necessarily always involving hearing the voice of Blake but also um, just just sort of um, 
various types of visionary experience. And some of them were also unpleasant experiences. I mean, some of them were much more like a bad trip and some of them, you know, involved, um, you know, feelings of intense sort of paranoia and, um, yeah, uh, the, the sort of doom of the doom of the universe almost. Um, and he wrote some poems about that experience sort of at the time as well, even though he wasn't yet a published poet and, you know, that was not yet a sort of part of who he was. Um, but it, it became, you know, as throughout the rest of Ginsburg's life and Ginsburg, you know, Ginsburg was born in uh, 1926 and died in 1997. So right up to, to 97 when Ginsburg died, um, this experience that he'd had in 1948 with which he referred to as his Blake vision, even though actually the, the reading of Blake's poems and the hearing of Blake's voice was really only one part of this experience. And actually it was a series of experiences over a whole week. And it was also almost as much triggered by reading all these other visionary books as well, you know, the, the, <laughs> um, not just Blake. Um, but nonetheless, he sort of, over time, very much associated this experience with Blake and called it his Blake vision. And it, it became a kind of cornerstone of his life, a sort of touchstone of, of his life and something that he wanted to talk about and that he wanted to share with other people. And he became... Yeah, it also increasingly interested in Blake after that. Um, in some ways, in a in quite an academic way as well. I mean, he you know came from a um, you know intellectual uh, middle class kind of family background with a father who was a poet as well, and um, never became uh, you know never got a PhD, for example. But he um, he ended up kind of teaching Blake and, and other literature in a university context as well later on in his life after the sixties. Uh, or from the late sixties onwards, so he throughout his life he sort of got closer and closer to Blake in in various different ways um, from this sort of very visceral, imaginative uh, kind of um, visionary uh, encounter that he'd had with with Blake's presence in as, as a young student to um, yeah to becoming something of a sort of Blake scholar him, himself later on as well. Mm. Just to clarify, this uh, this event that happened in 1948, this, if I understood correctly, this happened without the use of other substances. This was a kind of a spontaneous thing that happened over the course of the of, of days. That he wasn't yes. uh, taking any any substances to you know kind of induce. Uh, a trip, as you would say, mm. uh, but this just happened. So, uh, how did he? How did he view that? Yeah. So he. I mean, this is something that Ginsburg always very much insisted on that that this was a. He actually uses the word a natural experience, a natural, a natural psychedelic yeah. experience. You know that um, he he was very insistent on that, even though, as as I've said, actually his accounts of the precise details of the experience did change over time and did. Mm did you know that there are different versions of this story that he told at different times through his life and and he had he was also in a very open-minded way quite interested himself in to what extent should he take this as a sort of you know a, a real as it were kind of spiritual encounter and to what extent should he in, interpret this himself purely kind of psychologically he he you know he came from a family where there were mental health issues he had mental health issues himself at different points in his life, as many people do. Um, he was quite open-minded in some ways about, you know, do I see this as, you know, a kind of visionary passing of the prophetic torch from one poet to the next? And, you know, Blake is, you know, a, a kind of, you know, Blake having entered into him as, as Milton had entered into Blake. And he kind of wanted to, fit, you know, I guess, you know, he wanted that to be the case. But at different times in his life also he was... You know, he was quite sceptical about his mm. experience as well and also kind of questioning that. But, um, but yeah, he, he always insisted, you know, the one thing that, that he always kind of returned to was this insistence that it was not drug-induced. Um, he had, by that time, by the late 40s, I mean, he, he would have already encountered cannabis and he would have, uh, his, he, he and his beat friends also used um, amphetamines as well. Um, but he he wanted to insist that that during that during his actual kind of week or so of Blake visions uh, that, that that he wasn't high and, and he certainly hadn't um, he certainly hadn't yet discovered psychedelics at that time. Right, uh, right. Although he you know again I think something that's sort of not so well understood 
uh, amongst, you know, within sort of popular culture is that certain psychedelics, you know, especially um, peyote, were being used within American culture um, and, and, and sort of Western European culture uh, pre the, the 1950s and 1960s as well. So just because Ginsburg himself hadn't yet tried um, psychedelics didn't mean that they weren't around. Obviously, uh, you know, um, well, obviously LSD had, had in fact already been synthesized by that time, although it wasn't, you know, it wasn't in, in hadn't yet uh, begun to be used. But, um, but drugs like peyote had already been, been used quite sort of widely within certain kind of alternative scenes, I suppose you could say, you know, from the early 20th century onwards. But Ginsberg hadn't yet discovered that. And he, um, what is interesting is that then later on, after his Blake vision, as he called it, he did start to experiment, you know, quite consciously with, with a whole range of different psychedelics, sort of whatever he, he got his hands on, um, from, uh, from peyote buttons to synthesized mescaline to um, then later LSD, um, as well as other drugs like, uh, like nitrous oxide and ether and, you know, all sorts of different things that he could experiment with. Um, actually, almost with the, with the conscious intention of seeing if he could reproduce this natural, yeah. as he called it, kind of experience that he'd earlier had. Right. Um, and almost in a sort of experimental way, let's, you know, let's see if I can, mm. <laughs> see if I can do the same thing again. Um, and actually became, you know, from the late forties through until the early sixties, he also, which was also the period, you know, from the mid fifties onwards, you know, where he began to become quite famous as a poet as well. Um, despite that that increasing fame, he 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 began to see that he was almost a little bit obsessively um, uh, kind of attached to this. Blake vision experience that he'd had and that he was actually sort of almost trying to chase this this vision and sort of trying to obsessively see if he could reproduce it see if he could better understand it um through partly through psychedelic drugs as well and and from the there's also a whole kind of story within Ginsburg's life of of his um yeah, as he got involved in other religious traditions as well, and Buddhism particularly, how he kind of came to see that his attachment to this Blake vision could also be seen to some extent as, as unhealthy, you know, not necessarily because he ever saw drugs themselves as, you know, as bad or as, or as inherently unhealthy, but um, more the attachment to anything, you know, in a, in a Buddhist sense, um, the idea that, you know, being overly attached to something is, is not a healthy state to be in. And so from the sort of early to mid 60s, he, he kind of readjusted his relationship with his Blake vision um, to the extent that he wanted to try not to be quite so obsessively attached to it, I suppose you could say. To stay on that point uh, about this change that occurred when Ginsburg started to become more involved in Buddhism mm. and how the the vision that he had uh, also changed uh, his interpretation of it, I guess I should say, mm. Mm. Uh, you noted that uh, he saw poetry as a material catalyst for specific states of consciousness uh, or alternatively, or maybe simultaneously, a psychedelic universal cosmic co uh, consciousness. So he was uh, focusing more on the body 
the physical physical effects of the sound when the rhythmic sound if if you're reading the poetry breathing patterns things like that um so if i if i recall correctly what you were trying to say in the article it was that he kind of took it away from this um like highly spiritual uh, significance Magic. Yes. magical type of <laughs> yes. thing into more of a material physical type of uh, mm. effect yeah absolutely yeah that's that's something that's really interested me um is the way in which ginsburg as, as i said he he you know this this was a this was an experience that however hard he tried to kind of let go of an unhealthy kind of attachment to it he kept returning to and kept kind of mentally uh thinking about you know throughout his whole life and and yeah i'm particularly interested in how from about the mid 1960s onwards and then particularly in the sort of late 60s and and early 70s ginsburg increasingly wrote and spoke about um an idea that uh perhaps this Blake vision could be explained, as you said, in partly in a sort of almost oddly kind of materialist way, um, in terms of perhaps, you know, different breathing that we experience or that we use when we're reading things. Um, and I don't know whether Ginsburg was reading the poems out loud, um, but it, that does seem to be the, the implication, um, the Blake poems. Um, that that different different kind of breath patterns, uh, you know, might influence our as as we're reading poetry, um, or as we're reading literature, uh, but particularly poetry with its you know its sort of natural rhythm, um, might kind of affect the mind in a yeah in a in a um, in a chemical way, um, just in the same way that that ingesting a psychoactive substance might, so that it might sort of open up some of the same kind of pathways. And of course, Ginsburg. So Ginsburg went to to India in the early 1960s, and actually spent 18 months in India uh, from 61 to 63. Um, and really, then when he returned from India, you know, became one of the. I mean, one of the things I haven't talked about so much is how Ginsburg really was at the absolutely the center um, of the American counterculture through through the 60s, and and really was responsible for many of the, the kind of key ideas within the counterculture from, from flower power to an interest in, in India and, and in Indian religion as well and Indian spirituality and all, you know, Indian uh, style, you could say, almost yeah. as well. I mean, he came back from India in 1963 looking like absolute kind of classic hippie <laughs> with, the, with the long hair and with the Indian beads and with the, you know, Indian clothes. And, right. you know, and he was, you know, obviously people have been going, you know, Westerners have been going to India, um, well, since since colonial, you know, since the beginning of colonial times and, and engaging with Indian um uh, religion and spirituality, but Ginsburg was certainly, you know, one of the early people that sort of very much made that part of sixties counterculture. But so, so coming back from from India, um, yeah, he obviously, you know, he he'd become interested then in in chanting and in um, and in mantras uh, and yeah, in Indian breath breath work i suppose you could say as well so that that definitely fed into his his kind of questioning about um might it be that 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 there might be a sort of not only a spiritual i don't think he wanted to let go completely of this spiritual connection that he felt with blake and, and with the blake vision that he'd had but um but might there be a kind of breath related sort of explanation or element i suppose to this experience as well um mm. yeah which which is interesting it, indeed uh, and you also note that there were other people uh, who also informed Ginsburg of their own special experiences with Blake. Uh, so, you know, Blake is, of course, talking about, I'm sorry, Ginsburg is talking about Blake a lot with people. I'm, I'm mm, assuming mm, that, mm, you know, this is a topic mm, of, of discussion uh, in many of his conversations. And how was is there anything known? Did, did Ginsburg uh, say anything about it or write about how he interpreted the fact that other people were also having these experiences? Is there something that can be said about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
there's a sort of a there's there's a way in which on the one hand Ginsburg quite enjoyed a presentation of himself as a kind of lone prophetic kind of poetic figure um you know who had sort of almost been uniquely blessed by this spiritual encounter with William Blake and uh you know he he was uh, it, you know, I mean, um, I n- never, never met him. Although I know many people who who um, who did meet and, and know him, but but I, I think you know, I think he you know he had an ego, but he was also someone who was quite conscious of of you know the mm. of of his ego as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the one hand, this yeah, he you know he wanted to make himself uh, the the kind of special inheritor of uh, of. Of Blake and the Blake vision, um, but on the other hand, he also wants. You know, he was also incredibly sociable, and um, he he was described by one of his biographers, Barry Miles, who was also had also been a, a close friend of Ginsburg and collaborated with Ginsburg uh, as the central switchboard of the counterculture of the sixties counterculture. And he was, you know, he was obviously an incredibly sociable figure who really wanted to to create a movement and and you know he he i'd really do see him as actually at the center of 60s counterculture and i think you know i'm i'm british obviously and and in 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 britain he's not as well known as in the united states and and so you know i have to do a certain amount of explaining sometimes about why it is that i see ginsburg as being so much at the center of the counterculture but i think in america that that is kind of more a little bit more well known where people kind of appreciate the fact that he wasn't just this poet this beat poet he was also this kind of figure this popular cultural figure who there were posters of him there were you know he was a really famous guy um who quite consciously brought different elements of the counterculture into being and as i said he more or less invented the term flower power um and uh yeah he he wanted to create a counterculture and you know in obviously it wasn't you know, wasn't just him but uh you know he, he was a, he, he did you know he was he'd been in advertising as well he knew how to you know he knew yeah. how to promote things you right. know so and he knew how to promote blake um but he yeah so what i'm what i'm what i'm getting onto here is that he also wanted the blakean experience to be a kind of shared experience as well and he wanted to you know, and to some extent, I think he was sort of, he wanted to insist, even perhaps against the evidence, uh, he wanted to insist that actually something had sort of happened around 1948, so quite a long time before the 1960s, uh, and obviously, at, you know, at the same time, or almost as part of his own Blake vision, that some kind of widening of universal consciousness or even if it was just within other American poets of the period, or perhaps more generally, uh, perhaps a new era, you know, something in some way associated with Blake and with Blake's spirit and and Blake's, um, with his own Blake vision, that something kind of universal had sort of happened around then. Um, And so he was... Yeah, at different times he he really kind of emphasised that and sort of you know wanted to claim that uh, that that this Blake in experience was almost a sort of universal thing. But he also because he talked so much about Blake, he did encounter other people who had had interesting who were into Blake and who had had sort of interesting similar experiences. So um, there's a poet Michael McClure um, who is another another beat poet um, who when Ginsburg first met him. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, you know, they immediately connected because McClure had, in fact, also had some kind of unusual experience involving Blake. Uh, <laughs> McClure, as a teenager, had um, had had a dream, I think, um, where he was Blake, where he sort of became Blake in his dream. And, you know, just like with Ginsburg's experience, I mean, this can, in a way, be quite clearly explained by the fact that clearly McClure was really into Blake and was reading a lot of Blake and you know, he had a dream that he was Blake one night, you know. So yeah. in some ways, you know, there are different ways to interpret these experiences, you know, whether sort of very mystically, spiritually, significantly, or whether just as, you know, these this is what happens to our mind, you know. But um, but of course, Ginsburg loved that, that, you know, McClure <laughs> had this Blakean experience too. So, you know, they, they immediately bonded then and um, and there are other kind of strange things. I mean, so Ginsburg co- was corresponding with um, Bertrand Russell, the, the British philosopher, 
um, in the early 60s, around the time of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this was when Ginsburg was in India, um, and uh, Russell, you know, as well as being a sort of, uh, you know, key figure of 20th century philosophy, uh, was also very much part of the anti-war movement and, and sort of um, anti-nuclear movement. Um, and um, Ginsburg was corresponding with him, and at some point in the correspondence, Russell clearly told, must have told Ginsburg that he'd had that he himself had had some kind of strange experience involving Blake. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the letter from Russell to Ginsburg. We just have Ginsburg's reply. Mm. So we have Ginsburg's reply in which he's saying, wow, you know, you had a Blakey experience too. You know, like, but we don't quite know what it was. You know, it's a bit frustrating. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he kind of almost collected, you know, um, Blakey and experiences that different people had. And, and there were other people in his circle, other poets in Ginsburg's circle, who who were also really very much into Blake, and they weren't all turned on to Blake by Ginsburg. So Ginsburg mm. definitely turned a lot of people on to Blake, um, very much like, you know, you, earlier on you quoted um, Timothy Leary's famous, you know, uh, tune in, turn on and drop out, um, little aphorism there um, about LSD. Um, and, you know, Ginsburg more or less was doing the same thing about William Blake. We're sort of telling people, you know, almost yeah. deliberately going around <laughs> turning people on to Blake, you know. Um, so, you know, Bob Dylan, I've written about, uh, you know, the way in which Ginsburg definitely influenced Dylan's interest in Blake. Um, Ginsburg didn't know the Beatles as well as he knew Dylan, but he he, he met John Lennon and, um, you know, immediately asked John Lennon, have you read William Blake? You know, it's almost like his first question you know, on meeting the star, you know. Um, so he really was going around turning people onto Blake. But then on the other hand, as I was saying right at the beginning of the interview, um, you know, different people have been into Blake in different periods and as part of different kinds of kind of counterculture um, through, you know, through times, through the 19th century and through the early 20th century. And and so there are also other American poets of that period of the mid 20th century, um, some of whom, like Michael McClure, would have self-identified as beats and beat poets and others of whom would not necessarily have described themselves as beat poets, but were very much part of a similar kind of circle of um, what well, sometimes called new American poetry. So there was, a, there was an anthology of, of poetry that included a lot of these different figures, some of them beat, some of them associated with other poetic movements like the Black Mountain poets and other, other kind of mid-20th century um, kind of alternative poetic movements. Um, and they, Ginsburg, being this incredibly sort of sociable, friendly kind of figure who was also wanting to bring people together all the time, also a kind of part of the 60s, sort of, you know, come together kind of thing, <laughs> um, you know, um, was, you know, almost collecting these poets as well into some kind of broader movement, even though they wouldn't necessarily have wanted all to describe themselves as, as beat poets like himself. Um, and several of these poets independently had, quite deep, um, almost, you could say, spiritual kind of engagements with Blake, even if they didn't necessarily, you know, hadn't necessarily had a, a literal sort of Blake vision as Ginsburg had. So um, there are poets like Robert Duncan, um, Denise Levitov, uh, Diane de Prima, um, a slightly earlier San Francisco poet called Helen Adam as well, um, who were all re also, you know, really deeply spiritual figures uh, in their different ways and and all kind of in different ways and kind of included their their fascination with William Blake in that in that spirituality that they had as well so um yeah I don't know if that <laughs> answers some of that but <laughs> definitely it definitely answers it and yeah that there's the there was a type of spirit, as it were, a, a Blakeian mm -hmm. spirit, uh, mm -hmm. definitely kind of hanging around uh, for a lot of people. You mentioned Dylan, mm -hmm. uh, so let's get into the music side of, of all of this. You wrote a very interesting article about Ginsburg, Blake, and Bob Dylan ta titled Tangled Up in Blake, where you discuss how Ginsburg saw Dylan as a successor to Blake, but that Dylan was quite reluctant to receive that title and very reticent with regard to his own 
relationship with Blake. Could you talk more about this? I really like, I really enjoyed this article. I, I oh, highly recommend you. people to read it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so this was, this was part of a, this was a chapter actually that in a book called Rock and Romanticism. Um, and as you said, the, the, the chapter is um, tangled up in Blake. Um, the, the, it's a collected, you know, it's a collected uh, edition. And mm, my, mm-hmm. but my, my chapter is about um, Dylan and Blake. Um, and so, I suppose what what I argue in that, um, and and this actually this this is this takes uh, takes the story up to uh, 2012, I think, uh, to the to the the Dylan album called Tempest, because actually more recently Dylan's very very recent album Rough and Rowdy Ways has in, includes a a direct reference to Blake and on another song a direct reference to Allen Ginsberg as well. So actually Dylan's Dylan's uh, Ginsburg Blake, you know, tangled up <laughs> kind of uh, situation, as it were, has very much continued since I, you know, since I completed that article okay. too. But so that chapter, but yeah, um, so Ginsburg met Blake, uh, I think, at the end of ninety. Uh, sorry, Ginsburg met to Dylan, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, you know. um, at the uh, right at the end of nineteen sixty three, I think it was. Um, uh, I think it, it was sort of around Christmas, nineteen sixty-three, um, and they they found some kind of connection. I mean, Dylan has in different anthologies actually. Dylan has sometimes been included as a beat poet. There are different anthologies of beat poetry where, which have a you know a little a little Dylan section. So Dylan himself, you know, is clearly influenced by by the beats by Ginsberg and Kerouac and. Um, Actually, late, you know, you could say, especially more recently, by Burroughs to to an extent, through Burroughs's cut up technique or Burroughs and Brian Geisen's cut up technique seems to very much be a sort of influence on on Dylan's more recent work. But that's 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 for another <laughs> discussion, probably. <laughs> right. But but um, but yeah. So Dylan Dylan was definitely influenced by the Beats, um, and they he and Ginsberg met in 60, the end of sixty three. Uh, and quite quickly became really good friends, and 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 over you know over time kind of hung out together, and um, even uh, in different ways kind of collaborated with each other as well. Um, Ginsburg features in the um, the famous uh, video of, of of Dylan with the um, with the placards, you know, <laughs> for the subterranean homesick blues video. Ginsburg is there standing in the background of that of that video the whole yeah. time. Uh, kind of looking very prophetic, looking with his full beard and kind of look, he's actually carrying a stick like a sort of staff and he sort of looks like this sort of prophetic sort of Moses you know, old, old Testament kind of, you know, <laughs> prophet sort of standing in the background while while this young Dylan's, you know, going doing his routine with the, you know, with the cards, with the placards, you know, um, get born, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and so yeah they 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 were very good friends and they they remained friends until Ginsburg's death in 1997 as well and i think yeah what i wanted to trace in that chapter was was the 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 connect you know the the way in which Blake was part of that friendship i suppose you know um and the ways in which as you said i mean Ginsburg i guess because he want because he was very interested in popular culture and he was a part of popular culture but he you know he was interested in music he was interested in dylan and and the beatles and and he sort of saw i think the way in which he was excited by the way in which rock music and popular music of the 1960s and 1970s was you know a key part of this counterculture which he had partly kind of created himself um and and really you know was really fascinated by the way in which these these stars and he was all you know he also loved to you know love the fact that he was hanging out with stars as well I mean, after all there're not many poets who get to you know who get to firstly have posts of themselves uh you know all around the place and be in the background to uh you know, famous <laughs> music videos and whatever you know but also just you know he liked to hang out with with famous people uh people even more famous i suppose than himself <laughs> yeah. um, so um but yeah, he he wanted to. It's it's true what what you say that that in a way he kind of wanted to, he he wanted to shape Dylan, I suppose, in some ways as a kind of a successor to Blake, as you said. He he kind of wanted to, um, yeah, in the same way, I suppose, that he had sort of 
shaped the broader counterculture. He was he was kind of interested in you know what 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 might Dylan be presented as or or kind of become. And yeah, he was he was definitely interested in in a sort of seeing Dylan as as a sort of successor to Blake. And there's another. So I mentioned earlier Michael McClure. Um, so Michael McClure is this other other beat poet who was like like Ginsberg, who was very much. Um, interested in and connected to different uh different musical groups and scenes and figures of the period so uh mcclure was particularly friends with the doors mm. and, and with with ray manzara particularly for the, the keyboardist from the doors um and collaborated later with manzara as well um but mcclure was also friends with dylan um and of course the doors have their blakey and Right. Connection, the doors of you know, the doors of perception, perception being you yeah, know, yeah. being where they they got their name from, uh, from from Blake's uh, line in in Marriage of Heaven and Hell. If the doors of perception were cleansed, then things would appear to man as they are infinite. Um, so McClure and Ginsburg together were sort of like both wanting to see a kind of Blakean element to to dylan and were i guess turning dylan on to blake as well uh you know sort of literally ginsburg gave dylan different blake works we know um uh one of them as a as a sort of special present i think birthday present he gave dylan a kind of particularly nice edition of of blake's um songs of innocence and experience very nice kind of expensive you know reproduction of the work um and yeah, Dylan was in his sort of Dylan-esque way, you know, continually, you know, partly absorbing all of this, but also resisting it and also not wanting to show his, through through most of his, his career anyway, not wanting to show the Blakeian influence, I think, too strongly. And I guess what I argue is that he was quite aware of the fact that in a way, it was almost like there was almost a sort of struggle between him and Ginsburg, between Dylan and Ginsburg, involving Blake and sort of seeing the way in which, you know, almost Ginsburg owned Blake or Blake owned Ginsburg or something, and you know, and and to be too closely associated with, you know, with with Blake was somehow also kind of show the you know the way in which you know he was almost being. Uh, yeah, being sort of shaped, shaped by Ginsburg himself. There's, I, I see a whole sort of psychodrama going on there. Right. Well, actually, you know. uh, but, but then later, uh, later. I mean, there are, there are definitely, you know, multiple Dylan songs that very clearly are strongly influenced by William Blake. Mm-hmm. I mean, Gates of Eden from 1965 mm-hmm. would be, a, would be a really obvious one. But, and then later on in in Dylan's career, especially as I said, much more recently, he has started to. To very deliberately reference Blake. So there's a there's a song on Tempest uh, called Roll on John, which is actually a sort of tribute to John Lennon, uh, where he references Blake's poem The Tiger, you know, Blake's probably most famous poem. Um, and then, as I said, in, in his most recent album, the, the one that's, you know, just come out a couple of years ago, uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways, he actually uh, compares himself to to William Blake uh, very overtly on um, the song "I Contain Multitudes." Uh, so this is, you know, in a way, this this seems to show a sort of more relaxed. I suppose Ginsburg is long gone. Ginsburg died in 1997. <laughs> maybe you know, maybe Blake, maybe Dylan, sort of, you know, became a little bit more relaxed about showing his showing his Blakeian uh, influence, wearing it on his sleeve or something. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating kind of element of 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 the of the the Ginsburg Blake story, I suppose I you know I see that as yeah just just an interesting example of how to me it does seem like Ginsburg is very closely kind of involved in in Blake's reception within popular culture mm-hmm. through the through the sixties and onwards and there are I mean that there's there's been some interesting writing that there's an interesting academic called Mike Good. Uh, good with a with an e on the end um who has an article from 99 uh, from sorry from 2006 called blake spotting and and good is very good on the way in which blake because blake's work contains a lot of aphorism and a lot of kind of memorable phrases like the doors of perception like the um you know the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of experience a lot of these very biblical sounding really aphorisms that mm. you know that that blake 
uh, invented, but which you know very much sound like traditional proverbs. Um, that these these little bits and pieces from Blake, which then do keep kind of recurring within popular culture, uh, or some, to some extent almost sort of separated from their originator, you know, like, which is kind of what a proverb does, that it kind of spreads and, you know, it's, it's, it's authorless almost, even mm-hmm. though these are authored proverbs. And Good, is, uh, good wants to argue, Mike Good wants to argue that, um, that this this way in which Blake's work kind of spreads throughout popular culture without people even necessarily realizing that it's Blake that they're quoting or that, that, that they're referencing, that this is almost, you could say what Blake would have wanted or that this is, that this is, um, uh, that there is something, um, you know, the, the work itself is almost encouraging this kind of reproduction uh, in, in this form um, and it's it's an interesting argument, and he um, he connects that to to um, to Deleuze and Guattari as well, and the the rise the idea of the rhizome and this sort of yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. kind of structure of of form, um, and yeah, so it's I, I think you know as we we can see how you know Dylan clearly draws on Blake, but also sometimes wants to hide that or sometimes mm. reveal it. Um, and we can see how you know Blake. The more you, the more you look. I mean, this this term Blake spotting that that Mike Good <laughs> coins is very appropriate. You know, the more if you're a Blake scholar, the more you look, the more you see Blake just sort of everywhere, whether it being quoted or whether it's visually or you know or 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 um, in in literary form. Um, and in you know in the sixties though you know he would literally there were literally sort of Blake and graffiti appearing on on walls as well, and you know especially this. Uh, um, phrase about the the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of experience. This was a really popular one on the university yeah. campuses yeah, because of yeah. a naturally rebellious kind of <laughs> <laughs> message, Indeed. as it were, you know, <laughs> countercultural. Um, yeah, so no, just just connecting that to 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 Dylan's quite kind of magpie like kind of approach to kind of borrowing bits and pieces of Blake, but not all. Sometimes <laughs> revealing where it came from. More recently, he's been more overt than that. But yeah. I think earlier in his career, where it was coming via Ginsberg, for whatever reason, he was wanting to kind of slightly obscure that kind of <laughs> borrowing. You know? it's, yeah, that's interesting. It's a very kind way of putting it, magpieing uh, certain <laughs> elements of Blake. I found that that tension there to be interesting that, uh, while I can understand Dylan didn't want to be controlled by Ginsburg mm, mm. and didn't want to be con- yeah, seen as, as Ginsburg's little, I don't know, puppet mm. even, you yeah, know. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, but it was definite influence there. But then there was, you, you also brought up a, an aspect of, you know, Dylan wanted to be original, and yet there were these elements that he was taking over from other people, which with the Blake spotting, if if you accept that argument that, well, that was kind of like the intention uh, to to take over these phrases and these words and these these ideas and just make it a part of, you know, our 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 culture. That you know, it, it's just yeah assimilated into our culture. That on the one hand, you wouldn't feel like any um, you know any any hesitation of using that, but yet Dylan did evidently seem to have that hesitation of admitting that he that he was inspired by Blake because in one on, in one conversation he'd say well I tried reading Blake but it didn't really do much for me and then in another album he has this whole centerpiece uh, devoted to Blake so you know what is it you know <laughs> you're kind of like what is his game here but you touched upon um, an interesting point uh, and this, I think, on your on your part, was a little bit of uh, let's speculate here that maybe Dylan wasn't so you know readily uh, admitting about the the influence because he didn't want to be accused of plagiarism because he kind of had a reputation for nicking people's stuff if he liked it if he liked your music album collection he might steal some of your the records out of it so you know maybe he you have that kind of that trickster element of not mm. allowing people to really know what's going on with them on the one hand and on the other hand maybe trying to protect himself from accusations of plagiarism 
Absolutely, I think yeah, the the trickster and the and the game playing that's that's very you know very true yeah and and you know and 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 his constant desire to to frustrate almost his <laughs> his fans as well and to <laughs> to to to, to uh, retain some degree of sort of separation you know is to not be owned i suppose you know mm. by by anybody i mean it's it is understandable when you know when you have that degree of fame isn't it um but um but yeah i mean yeah i, I open the i open the chapter that we were just talking about this tangled up in blake chapter with um with this this little snippet from this this press conference from 1965 where you know one of these you, you may have seen clips on YouTube of you know, wherever you know of, um, of different kind of Dylan press conferences where he's totally kind of playing with the interviewer and the, and the audience and you know being his very sort of Dylan esque self in that kind of mid sixties period. And and this is a press conference where actually Alan Ginsberg, who as I said, he'd, he'd just become friends with, with Dylan about a year earlier, and um, Ginsberg was actually there in the audience, um, so not interviewing him, but just kind of one of the audience members, uh, and. Um, and Gin- Ginsburg, at one point, kind of asks from the audience as a sort of audience question. He um, he he asked Dylan within this televised press conference, "Do you think there will ever be a time when you'll be hung as a thief?" <laughs> it's just a, which, on the one hand, is just this kind of bizarre, almost kind of whatever, I don't know, surreal sort of <laughs> situationist or whatever kind of. <laughs> Frank, maybe you know, I don't you know what what on earth that's supposed to mean in the middle of a you know a kind of serious press conference, um, and then you know and then Dylan says um, <laughs> D- Dylan just kind of smiles and responds, "You weren't supposed to say that," you know? <laughs> and you know what does that mean? I don't know. You know this private joke almost between them, uh, but yeah, I sort of open with that kind of then questioning. You know, is there something behind that? You know. Dylan as as thief, Dylan as as magpie, kind of taking taking that, things. <laughs> now that you bring that up, doesn't that have something to do with a manuscript of Ginsburg yeah. manuscript that Dylan had? <laughs> uh, yeah, just yeah. this weird coincidence that Dylan has this man manuscript from a yeah, London so, publisher. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, so I I mentioned that in the chapter. So I I I can't say whether you know whether there is a direct you know whether whether Ginsburg is directly referencing this, but but actually, uh, so the the manuscript of the um, the uh, um, an early collection of Ginsburg called Gates of Wrath, uh, which is a which is a quotation from from Blake. Um, uh, this is an early collection of Ginsburg's, which wasn't published at the time. It wasn't, in fact, published until I think the nineteen seventies. I may be wrong about that. Um, but which is is basically kind of Ginsburg's juvenilia. It's 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 his sort of early stuff, uh, and it can and so it contains the the poems that he wrote in 1948 about the Blake experience, about the Blake vision, um, which are also in a way sort of juvenilia. They're very different in style to his to his later poems and to to Howell and and mm-hmm. Kaddish and and these famous poems of you know the poems that sort of made Ginsburg famous with their long lines and their their kind of you know, prophetic style, and um, these early poems are quite different in in style. They're much simpler in in some ways, but also in some ways a little bit derivative as well of of other poets. Uh, but this, so this, um, yeah, this collection, this unpublished early collection, which came to be called Gates of Wrath, somehow made its way into Dylan's possession. <laughs> um, yeah, as you said, apparently through a through a kind of London publisher that Ginsburg had sent the collection to, and then he hadn't returned it, and then Ginsburg didn't have his original copies, and it never got published, and, and somehow it ended up in Dylan's possession, <laughs> and Ginsburg found out. So, yeah, <laughs> and and was pleased, you know, in a way, was kind of pleased, and actually in the um, you know, in the uh, the preface to, to Gates of Wrath when it was then eventually published, you know, Dylan uh, Ginsburg tells this story and sort of says, oh, I came, you know, this came back into my possession through Bob Dylan of all people, you know, so. <laughs> and um, yeah, so um, that I, I do sort of speculate that there's there's some elements of, in terms of you know Ginsburg, uh, Dylan being. You know, is there ever a time when you'll be hung as a thief? Right. <laughs> I don't know, but there's some connection to that somewhere. Yeah. 
That was a great, uh, great anecdote. I thought that, yeah, I really, again, I, I highly uh, suggest that everyone go to academia.edu and find that article and read it because it was, it was just a joy to read. It was really, but it was also really, you know, educational in nature. If, you know, if I, like I said, this is a bit outside of my wheelhouse. So mm. this is all new stuff. And I really, yeah, I just, I, you know, I really soaked that all up. I really thought that oh, was thanks, great. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> yes, I have, put, I have put all of my articles on academia.edu. Uh, I think pretty much everything's up there. So Yes, yeah. I will definitely have the link in the program notes for that so people can just, you know, easy click on it and then they can find <laughs> it. Join us for part two where Luke and I talk about the esoteric connections to Blake and Ginsberg and be sure to check the program notes for links to Luke's articles and other resources.